Math scores in this province are something of a puzzle. Despite the infusion of millions of dollars by the Ministry of Education and an added emphasis by school boards across Ontario, those scores continue to slip. Other jurisdictions do better, with Singapore consistently outranking most. What are they doing right, and what do the rest of us need to learn from them? Susan Douglas is working to answer those questions. She is Chief Executive Officer of the Eden Academy. That's a group of schools for students with learning disabilities. She's also Senior Advisor to the British Council, the UK's International Organization for Cultural Relations and Educational Opportunities. And she joins us now with more. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. What more do we need to know about this British Council thing that I suspect many <laughs> of our viewers have never heard of? So the British Council is the UK's cultural relations organisation. It exists to try and promote mutually beneficial relationships between one country and another. So essentially what we want to enable people to do is to learn from each other. And what do you uh, do for them? So what I do is I work for uh, the schools department. I'm a senior advisor to the schools department. Um, and so what we try and do within that particular department is to support practitioners to learn from each other. Because yes. actually we're all trying to solve the same challenges. We've all got the same difficulties. We've all trying to do the best we possibly can for our kids. So it's a lot of teachers teaching teachers so how to teach. So it's about learning from each other, from exactly, each other. Right. exactly. And the Eden Academy, we gave a little hint about what the Eden Academy yeah. is. What, what, what so more do we need to know about In England, that? what we're doing at the moment is uh, lots of schools are uh, starting to collaborate together in clusters of schools. So the Eden Academy at the moment is five schools uh, who collaborate together under one chief exec. I'm the chief executive officer, as you rightly said. Um, all of the schools are for children who have some form of complex need. Um, and we're soon to open another two more. So um, one of the benefits of that is, again, learning from each other. You'll see that's kind of a popular theme from me that I think it's really important that mm. as a teacher, you constantly learn from each other about how to improve your practice. And are, is the Eden, or are the Eden Academy schools what we in Canada would call private schools? No, they're all state schools. They're, they're state all state schools. Okay. They're all state schools, yeah. So it's a new way funded. of working, all publicly funded, absolutely, but okay. with more autonomy now. So you can become an academy school, which means that you have more academy. I can set my own pay scales, I can set my own term dates, I can set my own. A bit like the charter school movement in uh, America. In the States, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, a bit similar Got to that, it. but yeah, publicly funded. Okay. And uh, it, I mean, the history nerd in me wonders, are they named after Anthony Eden? No, actually, uh, we ran a competition for our staff to say, what should we call them? And what should we call these group of schools together? Because they all have individual names. And so Eden stands for Educate, Develop, Enrich and oh, Nurture. Oh, OK, OK. So it stands for something instead. Isn't that nice? <laughs> and what brings you across the pond? So I'm here to attend a conference. It's called Research Ed. Uh, the Research Ed movement started in the UK as a grassroots movement um, and seeks to enable teachers once again to learn from each other, to share their research, to really analyse what's working in classrooms, what's, you know, what, what, what's moving children forward at a rapid rate. So this is the first time it's run in Toronto, so very exciting to have Canadian and uh, English uh, and UK um, delegates learning from each other and talking about all things education. Here's, here's my sort of conventional wisdom take on this, and then you will tell me why I'm wrong. Okay. okay? Canada's so different from almost every other country in the world, right? We're just an incredibly diverse society here. Yep. Uh, with people from all over the world, they speak 130 yep. different languages in the Toronto school board system alone. And, and many other countries, you know, that have great test scores like Finland yep. are much more, uh, you know, th th there's just much less diversity sure, in their sure. countries, much more homogenous than we have here. So is there really value in sharing best practices when our population bases are so different? This is my favourite question, definitely, okay, okay. because we, at the British Council, we have a particular belief in how you learn from another educational system. And we're going to come on to Singapore in a minute, yeah. obviously, but what lots of people would say about Singapore is, how can we possibly learn from Singapore? It's a tiny country. It's 278 square miles. You know, it, it only has 366 schools. What can we learn from that, you know, in comparison to Canada or in comparison to the UK? So um, what we do is we try to encourage people to, first of all, identify what's great about that practice that I'm seeing in another country. Once I've done that, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify, well, what's, what are the principles that kind of underpin that success? And then I'm going to reflect on my own practice and think, can I use those principles to improve 
my own practice. Because principles should be transferable regardless? Exactly. So practice isn't transferable mm -hmm. regardless, but principles can be. So to give you an example, if, I, if I'm a primary teacher, I always have examples, if I may. <laughs> um, so in, in Singapore, for example, if you've been a principal for six years, then you uh, are, are eligible to go on a paid sabbatical. Uh, so that you can go off and you can further um, develop yourself. Uh, For into, how long? Well, uh, it varies, but can be up to a year. Huh. Uh, now, when my English head teachers, uh, who I did this piece of research with, uh, heard that, they said, but that would never work in England. We could never do that. Well, that's true, because we can't pick up that practice and put it in England, and neither could we put it in Toronto. But what we can do is we can think, well, what's the principle that underpins that? Well, the principle that underpins that is that Head teachers, principals, you know, whatever you want to call them, need to refresh themselves. Mm -hmm. They need to continue to learn. They need to, you know, to, to further develop. And actually, quite often, sometimes they're the last people that do that because they're busy looking after other people in but terms of their professional isn't development. Isn't that what PD days are for throughout the year, to, to do that consistent re-education of the teachers? It, yes, and quite often it's the head teacher that's educating the teachers. So what this is about is this is about ensuring that head teachers also get the opportunity okay. to further they develop themselves and learn from others and learn from research. That's a key point. So that's what they do in Singapore that helps them be better. Is that what you're saying? It's one of the things one they do One of the things that they do. It's, so the principle is transferable, but that practice may not be exactly tra transferable. That. Exactly that. Okay. Is there such a thing as a Singapore style of teaching mathematics? Because their test scores apparently are way better than ours. They're, they're fantastic, absolutely. Um, but if you asked a, um, a head teacher or a teacher, I think, in, in Singapore, so what's Singapore maths? They'd say, mm, no, there isn't really such a thing as Singapore <laughs> maths. There's a set of... Um, there's a set of circumstances, there are, there are a set of systems that together enable teachers to teach really well. Um, so there's stuff about teacher expertise, there's stuff about curriculum, there's stuff about um, me the, the methodology of how they teach, um, there is stuff about their professional development. You know, the, the, so there's a set of circumstances that combined enable them to teach mathematics well. So there isn't such thing as a, you know, Singapore maths as such. There's a set of circumstances that create great maths teaching. Okay, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm freelancing here, so you tell me how off base I am here. Are there, are there simply some countries that culturally focus on math and care about math more than others? That's a great question as well. So um, it's interesting that in Singapore, for example, 20% of your curriculum time in primary one and primary two is spent on mathematics. In fact, so that most of your time in primary one and primary two is spent on maths and English and mother tongue, because obviously uh, the, the uh, Singaporean population is made up of the Chinese, the Malay mm -hmm. and Indian uh, population. So your majority of time is spent on mathematics. So the grounding in those really core subjects is really focused on a lot. So they've made the decision that we've got to be among the best in the world at math, and they are. They've made, the, they've made the commitment to do that uh, if you in a way go, the rest of us maybe haven't. If you go back in time, you know, when they became independent in 1965, uh, what they'd say is that their education system and the development of their education system falls into four kind of parts. And the first bit was about being survival-driven because they're a tiny country, they have no natural resources, not even water. People are the most important thing in Singapore. So what are we mm. going to do? We're going to invest in our education system, we're going to invest in our people so that we can get the best qualified people we can because that's to do with survival. So in 1965, that was the most important thing. Because they knew they weren't going to get rich selling oil. They got no oil. They've got no okay. oil. Okay, <laughs> got it. Uh, another trick, uh, the use of props in the classroom. Yeah. They, is, is there something distinctive about the way they do that? Well, um, I would say that one of the really interesting things about the Singapore system is its very deliberate approach to mathematics. It's deliberate and agreed approach to mathematics. So if you and I were teachers um, in the English system, you might teach multiplication one way, I might teach it in a completely different way. In Singapore, there are agreed methodologies. So for example, um, they have what's called concrete pictorial abstract that is always followed. So if you're to learn how to do something, you're going to start first of all with doing something concrete, with a manipulative, with a, with a piece of equipment. Mm. You're going to do that first before you move on to putting that into a pictorial methodology before you move it on in order to go on to abstract algebra, etc, etc. And there's an agreed way of doing that. So, so yeah, when you hear about, uh, about um, manipulatives, mm -hmm. then that's to do with that first bit of introducing a mathematical concept to a child in Singapore, which is to do with giving them something to do, first of all. Now, I think 
if you talk to lots of teachers around the world, they'd say, oh, we adopt, we, we do that as well, we do that as well. Mm -hmm. But I suppose it's the, about the absolute deliberate methodology that they have in Singapore, where everybody uses the same approach. And they have a spiral curriculum, which means that rather than doing, I'm doing subtraction, you know, now that I'm doing this over here. Instead, what they do is they start, they, they, will, they will continuously start again and repeat and f go further up the spiral with a particular uh, concept every time that they approach it. And what is the, as opposed to the practice, what is the principle there that is transferable to us so that we could get better? Uh, well, I think the principle um, uh, it, behind the concrete pictorial abstract, for mm -hmm. example, I think is just that. It's having, it's having more of an agreement about how you teach uh, a particular methodology. So um, if I take England as an example, but then I think that's transferable here as well, then the principle would be if you have eight primary schools in England feeding into a secondary school, mm -hmm. um, then part of the problem is that they all may, co they all may come with completely different... Uh, ways of working, or ways of, of approaching particular mathematical cal calculations. Um, so uh, those people can agree, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to do it this way. So huh. the principle is about making sure that you have um, uh, agreed methodologies, I think. It, it is underpinned by great teacher expertise. Hmm. And I think that's a really important point to make. But you don't get great teacher expertise unless the teachers get to refresh or renew their own education every so often. Absolutely. And we don't do enough of that, I guess. Well, and they also start really, uh, from a really high bar. Huh. So if, as you go in to be a teacher um, in, in Singapore, you're taken from the top third of graduates, first of all. Um, uh, but then if you do a, a Bachelor of Science in mathematical education, you are expected to reach the same level of mathematical expertise as if you were doing a conventional maths degree. Huh. Now, that's really important because actually it's quite difficult to teach maths. We all remember how we were taught it at school, you know, and, oh, you have to put a, a zero here or you have to, you know, put a, a, a square thing here or whatever. But, you know, actually remembering what, how, how, to, how we learnt it and, and, and why we learnt it and what the relationships are between the different parts of the methodology we're using, that's quite complex. So teachers really need to be quite expert in order to be able to do that. So... so Singapore makes sure its teachers are experts to start with, mm. and then 100 hours of, of continuing professional development a year uh, they're all entitled to. And much of that is subject-specific as opposed to generic. Now, I don't know what that's like here in Toronto, but um, in other places in the world, sometimes teacher tra uh, teachers' continuing professional development is often more... Um, generic than subject specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not a primary uh, school teacher, but can I give you an example? Oh, anyway, yeah. You tell me how as this long works. it's not a hard sum. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, I mean, I know 2 plus 2 always equals 4 in math, but uh, I, I read this in, in preparation for our conversation today, and it got me thinking that, you know, math can be a little more, well, let me just give you the example. You got a pie. Okay. okay. And, you, and, and you cut a wedge of the pie out, and it's, it represents a quarter of the pie, okay? So yeah. it's, okay. it's a quarter of the pie. Then you take that piece and you cut it in three. Right. What have you got? Twelfths. Well, interesting. You've got twelfths. I mean, in that's, that bit. <laughs> you've got twelfths <laughs> in some respects, but you've got thirds as well. Yeah, sure, you? sure, sure. Absolutely. So this I, is I, how yeah. we can all look at the same thing yeah. and have multiple interpretations of what's going on. Absolutely. So that's, that's sort of my long-winded, uh, strange example of saying... Is it not possible that the best educational experts in the world can all be looking at the same data and yet coming up with very different approaches, solutions, um, etc.? Yeah. I and think, then what do we do about that? I think a couple of things on that. Number one, uh, one of the interesting things about the Singaporean system is that it, it introduces concepts later, certainly than we do in England. So it makes sure that that factual fluency is really, really embedded before people move on. So people know their number bonds, they know their multiplication facts, and they know the relationship between numbers, which is your example a, of the pie. You, you just used yeah. an expression that I haven't oh. heard before. Number bonds? Number bonds? Oh, so number bonds to ten. So if I say to you uh, six, what's the number bond to ten would be four? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 So no, no, we've never used that never expression. Never used that expression. No, no, no. That's an English expression, okay. clearly. Yeah. But I get you now. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, so they introduce concepts later and make sure that children are really, really factually fluent and, and really understand the relationship between numbers hmm. before they move on to introducing more complex uh, 
algorithms and, and methodologies. I think it's, it's, it's almost like making sure that you know your words before you start to try and write a book. Right. You know, it's, right. it's, no, it's knowing that, I think, is, is really important. So it's being numerate. Yeah, Just exactly. being super numerate. Exactly. It, how difficult is it to teach educators to change their teaching techniques, particularly if I've been teaching math this yeah, way for yeah. 25 years and no one's going to tell me how, you know, stereotype, admittedly, but how tough is it to do that? It's really hard because uh, it's really hard to change a habit, whatever that mm -hmm. habit is, whether it's a teaching habit or a, or a habit you have generally in life. Mm -hmm. So um, what research shows is that, you know, as a teacher, you rapidly improve in the first three to five years of your teaching career and then you kind of plateau. Mm -hmm. And that's because you formed a habit. And so in order to try and change that habit, what you need to do is you need to practice doing something differently. And what research also shows is that teachers sometimes try to a new method and then give up pretty quickly. And, uh, and Joyce and Shower showed, showed that it took, generally it took a teacher between 20 and 25 goes at practicing something before it actually became part and parcel of the way that they taught on a regular basis. Mm. So one of the things in Singapore that's really important is the notion of teachers working together in what they call joint practice development groups. So you and I sit together and we've got to teach fractions to you know, our 11 year olds tomorrow and we sit and talk about how we're going to do that and then we go in tomorrow, we teach our classes, we come back out, we talk about how that went, what went well, what went different, you know, what didn't go so well. We try and improve it together and it's that notion of continually practicing your art which enables teachers to improve but that's not easy because it's hard to break a habit. Can I ask you a bit of a controversial question on that <gasps> regard? Go on then. Here we go. How helpful or not are teacher unions in your efforts to have teachers uh, share best practices and or re-educate themselves as their careers go on? Now, I can only answer that from an English perspective, can't I? And right. Yeah, and what I would say is that our teacher unions and our head teacher unions are helpful in supporting the profession to develop. Um, they run their own professional development, in fact, in lots of different ways. So I would not say that in England they are a block to improving uh, teacher techniques. They are always mindful of workload, as we should be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's quite interesting because uh, Singapore, uh, again, to use that example, uh, worked the second longest week uh, in terms of the number of hours that they do. So the teachers do? Yeah, huh. I think 47 hours or something like that. Interestingly, only 17 hours uh, are spent face-to-face -face with children. An awful lot of it is spent on planning, preparation, marking, huh. et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think, and so I think unions are always mindful of workload. So what I would say is we need, this is why we need conferences like Research Ed to say, well, let's look at what works best. Let's do less, but let's do it better. better. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. We appear to be, at the moment, incredibly obsessed with math scores, with the ability of our children to learn math, the, the eternal question, why can't Johnny do sums? <laughs> Are we too math obsessed or focused in the Western world, do you think? No. Okay. I would always say that. I'm a maths graduate, <laughs> mm. for a start. But I would also say um, that maths is at the heart of so many things and part of uh, so much of our, of our daily lives. It always upsets me when people say, well, I've never used that maths that I, I learned from school. One thing that I do think we need to do better in lots of different places is to support parents to support their children in, in this regard, in learning mathematics. So we, we all expect our, our parents to support their children to learn to read, for example, and lots of parents will feel confident enough to, you know, to try and support their children to read. But actually, there's some really great and easy ways in which parents can support their children to, to learn their sums, as you, as you just put it, with, but with Johnny. They, you're right. <laughs> but if they're not confident in math, it's unlikely they're going to want to help their kids be confident which in Which is an interesting point, isn't it? About Maybe we should send the parents yeah, back to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An interesting point about what mm -hmm. schools can do to support parents to feel more confident mm -hmm. about it, absolutely. Otherwise, we're just going to keep, you know, recycling the same problem, aren't mm. we? It's been a delight to meet you. And you. Thanks for making the trip over from the <laughs> British Council and the Eden Academy. That's Susan Douglas. And we're grateful you spared some time for us at TVO tonight. It's been a pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.